Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. Michael, typical day in the life of a financial advisor. Back to back yoga meetings, meditation. <laughs> so I financial planning meetings, prospecting. I didn't say that word right. Wow, uh, prospecting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, portfolio management, operations. So Y Charts has a tool that can help save time. It's this is a hack. Uh, a tool, a tool, many, many tools. tools, many many a tool. All right. So Y Charts reporting and perf- portfolio tools can help save time. We use it all the time to help save us time for this very podcast. Uh, clients want to hear from their advisors. We can't just be a person behind the scenes. Uh, so very user friendly templates. With ours, we have the Animal Spirits logo in there. Put your own wealth management logo in there if you want. Uh, you can do proposals of current portfolio versus uh, prospective portfolio. Educating clients is a huge part of being a financial advisor. If you want to join Y Charts and the thousands of other users, tell them Animal Spirits sent you. Get 20% off that first subscription. Animal Spirits, that's us. Go to YCharts.com. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Before we get the show started, I've got a little housekeeping announcement. Myself and Josh are doing a live Compound and Friends in Los Angeles, California. When the are we doing most, it? The two most LA guys I know. What does that mean? What is that, a shot? No, you guys are East Coast, New York. Like, you're the complete opposite of LA. Is that fair? fair? Yeah. Uh, Tuesday, April 30th, 2024. It is, where is this event? It's Rolling Greens on Mateo. Sick venue. You're probably not familiar with it. You're not a Los Angeles guy like I am. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We've got two guests that we're not announcing yet, but it's going to be a lot of fun. The show is, uh, doors open at 5.30. Show starts at 6.15. There's going to be whores divorce, cocktail hour. It's going to be wonderful. Tuesday, Easy. April 30th, link in bio or show notes, wherever you can find it. We'll see you there. I know it's a French word, but that's easily one of the worst spelled words in the world. It's impossible. Right? Yes, I agree. I, I Yeah, admittedly, I had to Google it. And if you um, sign, up, sign up for the compound newsletter, maybe you figure out who those guests are in advance. Oh, okay. Nice. There you go. That's a plug. Ben, you're looking you're looking good. You're looking fresh. You're looking young. Did you did you dye your hair? It's, I think it's just dark from being in here. No, I've not dyed my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I shave, maybe that's it. Uh I got the, Oh yeah, you the, got you, you got rid of the gray in your beard and the, the blue in the shirt, the purple, it brings out the eyes. You look great. A new Tropical Brothers hotness. This is their new release for this year, I think. That is very I, nice. I'm in Marco Island for spring break with the kids, and I have a few economic thoughts from my trip here. Okay, dude, you are just you are just spraying inflation all over the United States, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all over the globe lately. I think, but but that inflation piece, this is what I wanted to talk about. So you stayed. I gave you the JW Marriott that's here. It's a really well known resort on Marco Island. It feels like a Caribbean resort. It's, it's huge. It's got all these pools and restaurants and stuff for the kids. Wait, are you, are you are you staying there? No, we're staying at a at a Airbnb. Right, right, okay. Pretty so, so we went to the JW, but we talked to friends who stayed there. And so the first time I went there was 2018. My wife and I went, and it was still pretty reasonably priced. Like it wasn't that bad. Then we went a, a couple of years later after the pandemic. I think it was 2022 we went, or maybe last year. And you could definitely tell the prices had had gone up a lot. And a I think lot. You, you went so I, but and that's in like, I don't know, four or five short years. The prices, but I think this helps explain the US economy because I feel like a lot of these businesses realized, like, wait a minute, we actually have pricing power here. If we jack up rates, people are going to, they're going to be mad about it, but they're still going to pay. And I think for people who have money, it stings to pay more, but they're still going to do it. And that's- So I'm taking, I'm taking the family to California before our recording. Uh, my wife is a saint. She is traveling back to New York with the boys. I'm going to be staying for our work event. And we yeah, looked you, at the you JW. You big time for that. Two yeah, kids on a plane. We looked at the JW uh, as a destination. And my God, is, did it get expensive. I can't remember what the rates were, but it was. I was like, holy, no, no way. I'm not, no. So we, we heard from some friends who stayed at the JW here. And they had, you can't fit more than four in a room. So they had to do two rooms because they have a big family. And the number they threw out for a week there, that doesn't include plane tickets or the food is now way more expensive. So they actually fixed up the little bar that's right on the beach there, you know, Quinn's really great hot spot. 
but the the food prices are like what you'd see at a at a really nice restaurant in New York. But yeah, it's people, but, just, but it was overflowing with people, and they're still paying. So that's right. I think that helps explain the U.S. economy. Like all these businesses realize, like, oh wait a minute, these schmucks will still pay. We don't care. We're going to keep jacking up prices, and they'll still. And there's a ceiling eventually, but I feel like a lot of these businesses are going to try to figure out what that ceiling is, and the U.S. consumer is going to say, "This stinks," but I'm still going to pay it. I think you're describing what happened the last two years. Like they did yes. that. Yes. That's and inflation. I, yeah, but it. But then it discovers inflation. Well, no, people always get mad at me in the comments because I don't complain enough about inflation. This is me complaining about inflation. But I think it's uh, the the corporations are taking advantage of us, though. And we're not smart enough to figure it out. <laughs> I don't, okay, I also, a few, one of the things we've talked about a lot in the last couple months here is the, and we heard from a lot of people that the home insurance rates are so astronomical in Florida. And from afar, you think, why would people continue to pay those rates? And then you come here and you go, oh, I get it. Like if, if you were a if you were a baby boomer and, and you're in your golden years for retirement, you're you're gonna roll the dice. You don't care, right? You're gonna spend that extra money or or take that hurricane risk. You don't give a crap. Well, I think it, not to pick at the scab, but to say like, oh, why do people live there? It's like, well, what do you mean? People live there. They live there because they were born there. They were raised there. They have family there. They've had, they've been in a house for thirteen years. What they're just supposed to leave? But my point is that there's like but that's a, a but that's a that's a different cohort yes than people that are moving there yes a huge migration to the state right which right. which I think baby boomers this is my take for the next like 15, 20, 25 years baby boomers are going to put a floor under prices in every nice location in the country oh yeah there will be there will be a premium on on beachfront on vacation Sun, homes for water a long time. Night, yeah yeah like yeah. any of those places are going to have a floor under prices yeah I agree with that so, someone once told me. Uh, that his great, this is like a guy who's in his seventies. The, the best financial advice I ever got is a beach house never goes down in value. You could poke holes in that. Maybe it's probably true. Uh, it's probably fair. Come on. Yeah. I'm sure there have been beach houses that lost value, but all right. I have 6% more percent of the time. It works every time. I have some more travel anecdotes later, but I'm only halfway through my trip. So I'll save some. Okay. Um, so rest in peace, Danny Kahneman. Uh, he referred to himself, I think as the grandfather of behavioral finance. He gave the father nod to Dick Thaler, but he was an absolute giant. Changed the way that we thought about investing, the psychology of, of all that. It's hard to believe a lot of those original papers were written in like the 1970s. I know he's got some, yeah. but like he start, he did this behavioral finance stuff before any of us even thought about it. Is that a, you know, are you in we, New York? We've been trying to figure out, there's a fire station not that far from our place, but okay. we're trying, there's, there's, sirens nonstop here and it's kind of morbid to think about but i'm wondering if it's a lot of like heart attacks from old people yeah right it's hard to bring the mood down uh jason zweig wrote a beautiful tribute in the wall street journal i just want to read some of his words he said why do we sell our so these are these are condiments insights why do we sell our winners too soon and hang on to our losers too long why don't we realize that most hot streaks are just luck why do we say we have a high tolerance for risk and then suffer the torments of the demand when the market falls? Why do we ignore the odds when we know they're stacked against us? Uh, and these are, I think, economic, the, the economics um, profession, industry, assumed before economy came around that human beings were what they would call rational agents, that we would always act as the spreadsheet would say, that's what I learned in my economics classes in college. And the, the minute you buy a stock or have any sort of money on the line, you realize, oh, that's all nonsense. So my, I think my, I, I wrote about this. My biggest common takeaway is always, so Jason wrote about this. So he said, no, Danny said, money isn't the same. Money loss isn't the same as money gain. Losses are twice as painful as gains. And that concept to me, I think that's the most important concept in finance, how losses get people to overreact and panic and change the way that they invest. I think that, mm -hmm. that just that, that whole thing, his whole piece of losses sting twice as bad as gains make us feel good is so prevalent in so many areas of life. And I think that's, that to me is his, his like biggest insight. The other one I thought was, wait, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to stick with that. This is why bear markets are so, so dangerous. You spoke about money loss being twice as powerful as the feeling of when you win an equivalent amount. With bear markets, 
I'm making it up. It's 10 to one, right? Like bear markets ruin investors forever. And that's why it's important not to poo poo them as, and, and I don't think we're guilty of this. In fact, in fact, we're not guilty of this, but like to just say like, oh, it's part of investing. Like, yeah, yeah of course it is. We know just, that. Just stay the course. It's that simple. Right, just, yeah, just stay the course. No, it's not that simple because bear markets, like it stays with people, it wipes them out, it makes them impossible to recover from. And that's why, not to lecture here, but it's so important. Like now is a great time to prepare for the eventual bear market. And I'm not, that's not like a warning or anything, but like there's always an eventual bear market, right? And the time to panic is not in it. It's to put guardrails in place because we know that we're going to do stupid shit because we're human beings. That's that's the takeaway. I always, I always like to say that you should hold as much stocks in your portfolio as you'd be willing to hold during a bull market and a bear market. Like, so yeah, you're right. You're right. Now is the time to prepare for it. Not, you don't go looking for the black swan fund or, or have more cash and bonds after the bear market already happened, which is a lot of times how people think about it. But think we're in a, we're in a pretty good bull market right now. We're no in a one's bull market. No one's going to remember these feelings, right? In two years when it's over, when it, whenever it ends. But when the bear market is here, people will remember that. That that's the whole idea behind it. I also liked his- that's so that's so true. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone can recite the bear markets chapter and verse. Yes. Even if even if they were bear markets that you didn't even live through, right? You know them from the textbooks. Who remembers the bull markets? Yeah, you, we talk about the dot com bubble, but outside of that, yeah, people talk about speculative behavior. They don't talk about the good parts about bull markets. His other one, he said, the most important question to ask before making a decision is what is the base case. That that I think is another one that you can you don't have to be a hundred percent certain about something, but you can say this usually happens, so I'm going to assume it's going to continue happening until the facts change. Yeah. Also, um, one, right. one more. Th- oh, sorry, one more Go thing ahead. about this. Uh, Jason Zweig wrote about in his piece about how he helped Kahneman write Thinking Fast and Slow, and I didn't realize this until years and years later that he helped edit and and publish the book. And he said he had to he had a panic attack, uh, what two thirds of the way through the book, and didn't help him finish it. And uh, I just don't think he's such a humble guy. I don't think he gets enough credit for helping create one of the biggest best books ever on behavioral finance. You could, no disrespect to, to Kahneman, I mean, the, obviously legend, recipes, all that good stuff. Um, but you could tell when Jason stopped writing. You could tell when Jason stopped working on the book. It, it, the book did, it, it went a little long. I don't know how many people actually finished it. I got, if I had my copy here, you'd see I, I have dog-eared a million pages in it. But it's, it's a you know, very long you know, book. You know the, the, the drawing of the horse turning into a donkey? Yes. Speaking of that, so it's like Seinfeld scenario. about Larry. It's like Seinfeld about Larry David when he left the last two seasons. Dream. I, I don't get. I mean, I get the reference, but I, I, you know, I didn't get to the last two seasons of Seinfeld. Sorry, Dream. Pe- people. I was. This is a big point of emphasis for me. People always say that Seinfeld went out on top. He went on top because they were paying a lot of money. But the last two seasons of Seinfeld were. Eh, eh. Okay. Dream scenario was a bit of a horse and a donkey. Still a good movie worth watching. Oh, the Nicolas Cage. And there's two great, great cameos in there. Uh, Michael Sarah and uh, Cousin Greg. I think the fact that you got half or two-thirds of a good movie out of Nicolas Cage these days, is that's a win. Oh, no. The first half was vintage Nick Cage. Okay. I think that's a win, just to get a half of a good... Like leaving Las Vegas, Cage. All right. Somebody emailed us. Hey, Michael and Ben. In honor of the end of Q1, I made a list of all the things the social media and stock market TV perma bears warned us about coming into 2024, but that did not, in the end, send us into a correction, much, le- much less break anything. These were all things that were on the calendar and were supposed to happen in Q1. It's hard to remember all of them now, but here goes. So thank you, Kim, for the email. We turned his list into a chart with Ooh, the like help it. of our chart wizard, Matt. Uh, so here, here it goes. All the things that happened in Q1. By the way, 10% quarter. Not that bad. Is cra- that is great. The stock market's already up double digits. Pretty damn good. Uh, all right. People were really worried about the Microsoft earnings and guidance, right? The most this important earnings call run. ever. Most important earnings call ever. Then there was the Treasury's QRA. Uh, oh man, I honestly forget what that stands for. <laughs> I don't know either. Qualified repurchase agreement? I don't know, maybe something like that. It might have mattered Who for like six hours. Who's to say? Uh, the NVIDIA earnings and guidance, that honestly was a, that was the Super Bowl of earnings. They blew it out. Bank of Japan ends negative rates. Uh, and then the FOMC I feel like meeting. the Bank of Japan has ended negative rates like 16 times already. <laughs> Hasn't that happened a lot? And then the the token quarter end pension fund rebalancing. Ah, the rebalance. That so so we've obviously been climbing the wall of worry, which 
it always starts to happen. It's funny. We've I, I've heard from a few people lately saying Michael and Ben are way too rose colored glasses. Goldilocks and saying everything is great. We talked about Roaring Twenties last week, and someone said, "Listen, your takes are not going to age well," which is like the ultimate bear no thing to say. No takes age well. No takes age well. This is this is the internet. This is talking. But, everything ends ages poorly. Yeah. The, the except po- except uh, you know what you know what ages really well. Our twenty twenty three no recession bull market call that aged pretty well. That's true. Did it not? Call. Credit to us. But my whole thinking is we can say things are good now with the understanding that they, they're probably going to be bad in the future at some point. That doesn't mean that this stuff we're saying, that things are good now. It's true. That doesn't take away yeah, from what, the fact what, that what, bad things are going to happen in the future. So Listen. All right, listen. There is so much negativity in the world. And I don't need to put negativity out into the world when things are okay. Sorry, that's not me. That's not us. Yes. That's not us. If you come here to say uh, for for the world is ending, this is going to end badly. The deficit is funding the the sorry, that's not us. We're going to we're going to call it like it is. And when the economy turns and when the market turns, we're going to say, "Yeah, things we'll, are tough." We'll talk about that too. Yes, it's true. We'll talk about that too. It is it is kind of crazy. We just so we just had a bear market that we were underwater for 2 years basically. But look at this chart. From the this is admittedly cherry picked, but it's sometimes like cherry picking statistics. It's just me. The S&P is up 150% since the bottom in 2020. March 23rd, March the bottom, 2020. It's up, it's up 150% and 25% annualized. And we had a bear market in there. This has been an insane run. And that's, yeah. that, you know, yeah. so we, we had, that's, that's a bear market leading into that, obviously, 35% correction. And then a bear market, in, but it's, it's a crazy, crazy number. We had a crazy number. We had a crazy run. Yes. No doubt. Here, real uh, me this. I want to just yeah. talk about this. I was thinking about this because I saw people posting on, I'm not, I'm kind of staying away from social media and stuff, checking it occasionally. I was checking it during the Iowa LSU game last night. You probably didn't watch women's college basketball. My, uh, false, false, false. I came home last night, uh, from a dinner with the celebrity, not to brag. You'll, you'll hear about it next week. And I turned on the game and Robbie goes, why are you watching this? You never watch women's basketball. I said, hello, Caitlin Clark, kind of a big deal. My daughter is the biggest Caitlin Clark fan ever. Is she a bandwagon fan? Maybe. But <laughs> don't tell her I said that. She's got like the Caitlin Clark jerseys and shirts, and she, she's watched like literally every game this season. So I've watched more women's college basketball than ever watched in my life. And the game was absolutely amazing. So I was following on social media. So I saw people posting that gold is hit all time highs. This is crazy. I don't know that you could have. We're so good at Wait, finding. Wait, hold on. What, what does gold have to do with Caitlin Clark? Oh, I, I, that was the one time I was on social media. People were. Tweeting about oh, gold yeah. during the Iowa game for some reason. Uh, so we're always really good at retrofitting narratives after the fact. But think about this. This year alone, stocks all-time highs, gold all-time highs, Bitcoin all-time highs with 5% T-bill yields. What, what scenario would that have ever made sense ever two or three years ago? Where you could say, listen, in 2024, stocks, gold, Bitcoin are going to break out and you're going to have 5% T-bill yields. I got to be honest. I don't know what's going on. Uh... And I'm happy to say that because don't doesn't gold respond to like real negative rates? Like, isn't that good for gold? So we've got real positive rates. In fact, you have the 10-year breaking out. You've got the dollar ripping. Shouldn't this be bearish for gold? And yet, go figure. I don't know what's going on, Ben. I can't, I can't explain. That's it. the thing. Gold is supposed to follow real. If real yields rise, that's supposed to be bad for gold because it doesn't pay dividend or earnings or anything like that. And it's when yes. real yields fall, that's supposed yes. to be good for gold. And <laughs> I don't know. All right. Good one is gold Ke- is is gold saying that inflation is going to come back? I don't know, but gold didn't do well the last inflationary run. Gold did shit, right? Am I wrong? <laughs> in two thousand in two thousand twenty two, gold a risk. Maybe Bitcoin like broke the severed the ties of gold for macroeconomic relationships. I don't know. Getting back to my idea of corporations taking advantage of inflation and being good for corporations. Kathy Jones tw- tweeted this: Corporate profits rose to new all time highs in Q four of twenty twenty three. Obviously, some of this is inflation, the profits, but look at look at corporate it's profits. So f- it's so far above trend, probably even if you adjust for inflation. It's uh, yes. yeah, they're really they're really good at making money. Yes, that, that that's like if if you any any of the the spare stuff you want to talk about headwinds and stuff, but corporations are really really good at this. Like I, I just can't imagine being a long term bear against the stock market. I, I I could never understand that posture. Ben, have you, have you, you can't avoid like the price of chocolate, right? Yeah. I, I mean, it seems like this happens once every three to six months where there is a certain commodity and they show the price chart 
and people joke about it and they say, take me somewhere. My wife said, take me somewhere expensive and they show the chocolate out or whatever. Oh, uh, yeah. Funny. Javier uh-huh. Blas uh, had a good thread. Um, all right. The price is, cocoa prices have surged more than 250% over the last year. $10,000 per metric ton, nearly double the record highs at 46 years ago. So the long-term chart looks like most long-term charts and then whoosh, it's going straight up. This is unusual. Uh, there's a historic shortfall. So that's what's part of what's is driving it, it. Weather or what? The cocoa market will suffer a large deficit in 2024 for the third consecutive crop season, the most pronounced shortfall in modern history. So more buyers and sellers or more, more buyers than growers or whatever. So part of it is weather, just really wild stuff. I was going to mention this in my recommendations, but I talked about bananas being so cheap a couple weeks ago, and a bunch of people said, you got to read The Fish That Ate the Whale Great by book. Rich Cohen, the book about the banana trade. And they talk about how the weather was so bad at one point in like the late 1800s that there was a year without bananas and how that like scarred people for life back then. But that, that book is, that's one of the better business books I've read in a long time. But I feel like we can't have that kind of, you read it too, how he like yeah. went and he trudged through South America. Like bananas were essentially undiscovered for America. And p- the, these handful of people brought them to America. That sort of undiscovered thing, un- like just can't happen again. Imagine being like, I don't know, 25 years old and tasting a banana, having <laughs> never tasted, you're like, what the fuck is <laughs> right? this? Yeah. <laughs> and they talk about how they they knew exact amount of time it would take for them to go bad and they'd have to, to boat them up for, for two weeks. Uh, it's it's really an excellent book. And I think just the tone of the book too is, is very well written. Really, really good. You know what? I was, I've been thinking about getting back into reading. So this to Robin yesterday. She's like, yeah, when? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's tough. I do most of my reading on an airplane, actually. But uh, I, I took re- the first step, though. I, pack, I, packed, I put a book in my book bag. So I'm thinking about thinking about it. The best way to do it is, I've been trying to get you on this for years. The Kindle paper white is, I put it by my bedside table and I read for 20 minutes a night before I go to bed. It helps me sleep. Yeah. Because you can read it in the dark. All right. Larry Fink had a annual letter for BlackRock. And I thought this, I pulled this piece out because I thought it was really interesting. We've talked for a few weeks. You brought up about what do you call the monetary premium in stock for people putting money in. Not my my words, but yes. Okay. So Larry, I I never realized this. Uh, I'm going to read what do you have to say. Most Japanese keep the bulk of their retirement savings in banks earning a low interest rate. If it wasn't such a bad strategy, it wasn't such a bad strategy when Japan was suffering from deflation, but now the country's economy has turned around and the Nikkei surged. Most aspiring retirees are missing out on the upswing. The country didn't have anything resembling a 401k program until 2001. Even then, the amount of people could contribute was quite low for income. Uh, so a decade ago, the government launched a new savings account to encourage people to spend more. And the goal is to have 34 million Japanese investors before the end of the decade. And there, he's saying it's going to require Japanese government to expand their capital markets. And the hope is that like we're going to have way more people investing. And it's like these other countries, I mentioned Italy last week, catching up. These other countries are, are catching on. And they're going to say, why don't we make the stock market hold it up like a shrine like they, they do in the United States? And have it be part of everything we do, and it's part of the savings program. That sounds like a that sounds like an easier said than. I mean, that's like a yes. We've been doing this for a long time. It's it's Never. it's a total cultural change. Yeah. Uh, here's another one that he. I, I just pulled this out. By mid-century mark, one in six people globally will be over the age of sixty-five, up from one in eleven in two thousand nineteen. To support them, governments are going to have to prioritize building out robust capital markets like the U.S. has. Here's the other thing, though, with people living so much longer, think about how much more time to compound the baby boomers wealth has than any other generation ever. So they're the richest generation ever. They're going to live longer than any generation of the biggest generation ever to live that long. Their money is going to compound for longer. So that, that spread between how much wealth they have and how much everyone else has is going to just continue to get worse, right? The compounding effects for that wealth is going to last longer than, than anyone has ever had before. Because mm-hmm. they've been saving since the early 80s when 401ks and IRAs hit the market. All right. Uh, a listener of the show sent this in to me. Mark Hadala sent this in. He said, hey, I made it into the Wall Street Journal as a commenter like you like. So he, so I'm going to give him some credit here. 58- Wait, did, 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 did he give fake comments? He gave Was he like comments. in on it? Okay. <laughs> no. So he said he answered a little thing saying if you have invested in NVIDIA. So he says he's a 58-year-old professor in Kirksville, Missouri. See the MO? That's Missouri, not Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> he first bought NVIDIA more than two decades ago after a student introduced him to the company. Now, given this monster rally, he's planning to retire early next year. The stock returns have made it ridiculous to keep working. 
So you mentioned a couple weeks ago, like I, I am up 50, 67% of the stock. I'm out. I, I made, I, I couldn't hold a 10 bagger, right? Depends on which stock, but generally speaking, correct. I think I'm, I'm in a similar boat as you. I, I don't oh, by know. The way, hold on, hold on. Just, I will ne- you're right. I will never, ever have a 10 bagger in my entire life. Like what's my ceiling for how big a gain I could take? I don't know, but no, it but ain't, it, for us, for, it's going to be index funds for us, right? <laughs> Those are going to be our 10 baggers someday. True. Hopefully. But, but what percentage of investors do you think have that ability? Because I think it is, it's something your, your risk appetite or whatever in your brain is you're just born with that. How many people have that? Because the people who held Bitcoin from like 10 cents to now at $70,000, like those people are legitimately insane to me that they have the ability to do that. I think, I think, and I'm generalizing, I suspect that for most people with monster gains, they're like afraid to sell. In a good True. way or bad way, I guess depending on how you look at it. They're like, "Why would I sell Nvidia or or my Apple? Look how look how good it's done. I don't want to leave gains on the table. Like, why would I sell? What else am I going to buy?" And I think that they have that mentality, whereas we don't, for reasons that are that I already described. What was the stock that your uncle held for years and years and years with huge gains? Because you have this, you obviously have this in your DNA somewhere. Someone in your family yes. has this ability. So I've told the story, but for newer listeners that never heard this, I, I write a lot, of, or not so much anymore, but I used to write a lot about the dangers of picking individual stocks. Just all the statistics are against you, right? Like for every NVIDIA, uh, there's a million other stocks that are, that are not, that just crash and burn. Right. There's stocks that crash and just never come back. Never hit those so highs again. my uncle in 1996 bought a little small biotech company called Celgene. I don't know what the market cap was at the time. I'm sure it was under a billion dollars. And he bought, I don't know, $25,000 for my mom, $50,000, whatever it was. And that stock changed our life. Because my mom, when my parents got divorced, my mom went back to work. She, you know, she never, she didn't graduate college. So she was a secretary or something, you know, didn't make any money. But that stock, like legitimately turned into a million dollars. So my mother was the, oh, if you put $10,000 into right. Uh, and, and that's, but, but I remember vividly, like when Selji went down, like it was, it was a big deal. Like that was everything that she had. How has that stock performed in recent years? Have you looked at it lately? It was bought by Bristol Myers. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Okay. Probably, he, uh, eight years ago or so. So your uncle went out on top. He didn't have to like ho- potentially hold it and it stagnates or goes down or whatever. But, but he's, but he's a great, a great example of why would I sell a stock that has treated me so well? I think that's the prevailing feeling for people that have giant gains. This is going to sound like a put down and it's not. I feel like in some ways you have to like have a little, you have to be a little naive. Like <laughs> we're, totally. we're not <laughs> to, to, this do, is not, to do this, that. This is, this is not a diss. It's just right. that we know the data, right? We know, we know base rates. We right. know all that stuff. Uh, and so we're incapable of holding a 10 bagger, which is fine. Yes. The base, and, and cr- the, yeah, the base yeah. rates have like ruined us. Yeah. And this is actually, this is one of like the big dynamics in the market over the last decade is Joe's over pros. How many retail investors have beat the shit out of professionals yeah. over the last decade thanks to the Apples and NVIDIAs of the world? A lot. And also, and also how many base rates have been destroyed by these tech stocks? They took that, the base rates and, and dragged them out and beat them to death Smashed or Smashed them against the ground. That's, that's exactly right. You, you know the scene in Office Space where they're smashing the fax machine? Yes. That's uh, uh, the Magnificent Seven to base rates. All right. I'm going to be interested to see what Duncan and John and Daniel come up with for the video for this one. <laughs> right? If you're just a listener, we have very good production value on the YouTube videos as well. All right. I, a couple weeks ago, said uh, inflation is over, and a bunch of people said I'm an idiot. That's fair. They can think that. I looked at all the inflation rates for the G7 countries, US, UK, France, Canada, Japan, Germany, Italy. All of those rates are 3.4% or lower now for inflation rates across the globe. They all followed a very similar path. Japan Mm -hmm. is the only one that didn't really keep up on the upside. Isn't this the the case for inflation kind of being over, however you want to define that? I mean, I I mean, like the scary, like inflation is a huge, I'm not takeaway, like, yes, I know the baseline is set higher and all that stuff. But like inflate, like high rates of inflation, like four, five, six percent. I, I think that's... just 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 to be very clear, what you're talking about, you're talking about the five, six percent inflation is over. The scary high inflation; those rates, I think, are done. Yeah, fine. 
I guess my yeah. point was, and obviously you would agree with this, is like that doesn't really matter. No, and not of course it matters. It doesn't make anybody feel better about the price that they're paying today, right? And you would agree with right. that. The other part yes. is that uh, my twenty six dollar Miami Vice the other day. Yeah. <laughs> the other part is the ten year is breaking out. The big floater is, though. Big floater. The ten year is at the highest level since November two thousand twenty three. Uh, it spiked yesterday when the ISM prices paid component came out. And so, and WTI is, is breaking out. Crude oil is breaking out. Yeah, that, uh, that inter- probably is the big risk is commodities. Interestingly though, so the S&P is down 1% today. Maybe we'll finally have that, <laughs> the 2% pullback that, right. that, we've been, that we've been waiting for. But it is kind of remarkable that like stocks are sort of kind of barely responding to higher rates. Right, and I mean, it's down, or it's just, down, they're down one. They're down. You know, the SP is down one percent today. Big deal after this run. You would expect that. You know, could give a little bit more back. Yeah, it happens. Um, okay, so I think my like easiest call for the year was consumer sentiment's going to break out. It just broke out to a new high for the first like high since early twenty twenty one. It's almost lapped those. But if you look at this, wasn't COVID just the the big reset? And I, I know we've talked forever about like the reason sentiment is so bad. But I mean, if you just look at how bad. It fell during COVID. Isn't is that a simple explanation for sentiment that 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 whole period just reset sentiment lower? No, it was inflation. Look at the look at how big the consumer sentiment dropped in 2020, though. You know, of course, of uh, yes, there was a gigantic uh, drop in consumer sentiment, as you would expect when the economy shuts down, and then there was a hell of a rebound, and then once inflation kicked in, the bottom fell out. Interestingly, yeah. though, we're having this uptick while gasoline prices are coming back. A lot of people were saying, like, the consumer sentiment is just gas prices. We'll say right. if gas prices continue to rise, I'll be interested to see what happens to consumer sentiment. Uh, all right. This is a great chart from Bank of America. TSA seven-day moving average, millions of passengers. And 2024, way higher than pre-pandemic, way higher than even last year at this time. <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, Ben... I know you're flying. I'm flying in two weeks. I thought that that we were going to get the travel out of our system. Uh, it's really remarkable. I, I I could not have foreseen this coming. Well, the other thing people said was, listen, business travel is impacted forever because of work for home. No one's going to travel for business anymore. That was the How easy wrong one. we were. How wrong we were. Uh, somehow, though, I found... I want to have this week for spring break every year because we're in like a lull between like spring break was... A lot of the spring break just happened and there's more coming. Like yours is in a couple weeks, right? Mine is in two, two, three weeks. Ours is, it's not that busy right now. The travel actually wasn't that busy hmm. for me, which was kind of nice because I think we're in like a middle ground of, of spring break. Know what I just learned, Ben? Speaking of travel, silver medallion on Delta, not to brag. Okay. It's the, it's the first medallion. Here's a, okay. I'm pretty, pretty sure I've had that for a while. Do you not have the Delta card? Of course I do. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a late bloomer to the Delta card. I only got it like a year or so ago. All right, so here's a question for you. And I'm not judging anyone who does this, but I'm just, I think I could never do it. So we're taking our flight down and we're in like row 30, whatever, you know, because you have five people. Uh, kids in first class. There was two kids sitting in first class on the way to spring break. What do you think about kids in first class? Because my thought is I could never do it because I do not want to expose my kids to having that once and then taking it away. And then they're going to go like, wait, why, you know, but... So what are, you, what are your thoughts on kids in first class? Because I could see it maybe like, I don't know, you're taking a trip to Europe or something and you want to sit in nicer, but I could, I could never expose my kids to that to give them the taste of it. Okay. I don't want to judge, but that being said, I'm 100% with you. Okay. Uh, I, I even feel weird that I'm taking my kids so many places. Like I, yes. so growing up, I, we, were not a, we were not a plain traveling family. I know a lot of families in my town that went to Aruba I never went to a tropical place until I was like in my 20s, maybe. So I, we were we were car trip people, right? We drove to Washington. We drove to, to, to Boston and, and Philly and things like that. So no, I don't want to expose my kids to first class. Trips trips are way bigger these days than they were when we were growing up. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. People go further. and But yes, I, I just, yes, I agree. I, I feel like my kids are already spoiled enough as it is. I can't imagine putting them in first class and how entitled they would feel. Yeah. Again, not judging. That's just not, personal. Not, no, we don't judge here. Uh, oh, Two, two more things on the travel. One, if you're flying into New York, LaGuardia, no more JFK. I'm, I'm done with JFK. LaGuardia new, is, it's so much better. I flew back through JFK from Italy and you're right. It was 
awful, awful experience. Oh, oh, it's, it's really, it's very. Uh, and the new LaGuardia is so nice. They did a great beautiful. job of that. Last yes. week you t- you spoke about you were disparaging Delta about the movie selection. I was like, what are you talking about? I just flew and there was like 97 movies. On the way back from Colorado, Ben, I was on a, a Delta plane with like the smaller the smaller movie screen, like the old one. And I was surprised to see there was only like 15 movies. Okay. No, but I, st- I had a lot, but I just, maybe it's because I've seen everything. There's just, there's no new good movies. I want new stuff that maybe I'm more complaining about the movie industry than Delta. I just think they need to have, they need to have Netflix. I think they have Paramount Plus or something on there, but just put Netflix and Prime and HBO, put all my streaming stuff on there. I know you can do it on the iPad, but the Wi-Fi never works. All right, Ben, I want to ask you what's going on in the labor market. Connor Sen tweeted, we've been in a rolling recession for white collar hiring. Kind of wonder if this dynamic similar to other bullwhip credit sensitive industry downturns that we've seen. And it picks up later this year just because it has to. And he's looking at professional and business service hires rates. So I think what this is showing is hires as a percentage of employees. I believe that's okay. what it is. Uh, interestingly, Vanguard had a similar study. Van- our Vanguard 401k data indicates that hiring rates for the bottom third of workers who make below $55,000 per year are generally higher than those for higher income workers. And then they say, while hiring rates for high income workers are slowing, we have not seen a material pickup in the unemployment rate for that income group. We've seen layoff announcements for high income workers, most notably in the technology sector, but they've often been able to quickly find new employment as their skills are in demand. So I think that the lower end, whether it's middle or bottom third or whatever, of workers having a very strong labor market with real wages increasing pretty rapidly has been a huge boost to the economy because those people spend every dollar they make. Yes. I I had a friend try to make the case to me that upper middle class people have gotten the shaft in the last five to 10 years because they're paying maybe higher taxes and the people who are way better, more money than them are doing a lot better. But the people on the lower end have been brought up because wages have come up. I would not go that far to say that. (laughs) But well, you just, could you could you could think that you probably shouldn't say it out loud. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I, I think this is maybe something. So it's these blue collar jobs, I guess, that are that are booming in higher wages, and the like you said, the white collar middle manager job. I guess is that fair to say that that has been falling off a little bit? That is interesting. I don't I don't have a good explanation. Well, for think it. think about the, think about who the technology pe- uh, companies were cutting, or just generally. Oh, wh- true. Where where do companies cut where they're trying to? They cut the fat, and the fat is middle management. Hey, you're making one hundred forty thousand dollars a year. Like, what are you? Do we? We really- did. We did hear from someone in the YouTube comments last week. I still go in the comments every week. Michael's never looked. I'm just throwing it out. Listen, there. listen. Of course, <laughs> I look. There are several reasons why I don't. One is I don't think it's natural to reach strangers just flinging shit at your face. I don't want to feel. I don't want to have strangers ruin my ninety. Day, but- ninety percent of it is positive or jokes, and the other ten percent. Sure, sure, listen, I'm I'm sure it is. But more importantly than that, in all seriousness. I don't want what I'm, maybe I'm peeling back the curtain too much on this. I don't want what I'm saying to be influenced by one person in the back of my head. True. Because, because I got, for the rest of the audience, who's like, what, the, who is he even talking to? I don't want to talk to people. I don't want comments in the back of my head as I'm trying to entertain and educate our audience. Fair? Is that a sub, is that a subtweet towards me? No, it's a, no, the, the, <laughs> I'm no. kidding. We can move uh, on. No, but but some anyway, someone in the comments was saying that like, listen, I work in the tech field and it's kind of brutal out there with the layoffs and the they they were saying like it's people think the tech is awesome, but like a certain subset of people in that industry, he's like, it's it's pretty tough. So I I kind of get that. All right. So I saw this stat the other day. Someone posted on Twitter, one third of all purchases are being done in cash right now. And you hear that number and you go, gosh, that that just that just doesn't sound fair. It's boomers, blah, blah, blah. But I I clicked through the source data for Redfin. And look at the chart here. This is homes purchased with cash, where there's no mortgage loan information on the deed. That's how they define cash. I don't understand. I, I, I just don't understand. It's been roughly, it got as low as 20%, but that was briefly in the pandemic. But it's been around one third since 2011. And the median it's, home- it's, it's almost the, constant. The median home price is what, 400 something thousand? Yes. Where's all this cash coming from? People selling their NVIDIA? I, so they, they also put in here, they, they said, uh, 
While housing is expensive, affluent Americans who can pay in cash are more likely than lower-income Americans to be the ones buying. All cash home sales rose 3% year-over-year in February, where mortgage home sales fell 3%. This is just the housing price how expensive it's gotten is going to make wealth inequality worse because the young people who, who are going to be able to afford to buy in these expensive areas are going to get help from their parents. So, like the wealth transfer is going to happen faster, right? They're going to say, listen, mom and dad, I don't want my inheritance in 30 years when you pass away. I want it now. Help me buy a house. Wealth and inequality, it's a one-way train. It's never going to get better. It really isn't. And the, th- the thing is, people always pointed out that like it's bad. It's, it's always been bad. It's, it's always never been, been bad. Been, yeah. Unfortunately, it, it really has. So I also think if and when rates fall, uh, I, I would have thought mortgage rates would have fallen more by now. I can't believe they've stayed at 7% this long. Three people I know that I've talked to in the last two or three months are doing massive remodeling projects on their house. Like, oh, yeah. Like had to move to a different floor or like grandparents' house to like redo. And they're pulling that equity out. I think when well, rates dude, fall- Dude, if you, if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of money that you could tap that, that didn't exist, you're going to do it. And, and don't you think the thinking would be in that scenario, ah, geez, HELOC rates are like 7% now, 7.5%. But if rates fall and the Fed cuts, those rates are going to fall too. Because those are market mm-hmm. rates. They, they, but I think when those rates fall, we're going to see, even if you got to like 5%, the cash out refinance boom is going to be massive. We've gone from like $10 trillion in equity 10 years ago to 30 something now. We've had a $20 trillion in equity, home equity. Wow. People are going to tap that stuff. Uh, Bill McBride tweeted this. Single family active inventory. It's finally coming up. It's fi- so 21, 22, 23 were well, 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 geez, so much below pre pandemic levels, but it's up 26% year over year from 2023. It's, it's, still, it's, still down, it's still down 38% from 2019 levels, but start to see some inventory come on. So, do you think this is more higher mortgage rates finally having an, uh, an impact, or do you think it's just People can only hold out for so long until they have to put their house on the market. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. I, there's a there's a home in my neighborhood that just sold for 1.2 million dollars, and I don't even I don't even know what to say. You would not you would not you would not believe what this house looks like. It's a fine house. It's a high ranch, which is the type of house that I grew up in where you walk up the steps, you open the door, there's a downstairs with, with one bedroom and a living room. Is this you the one you were talking about a few weeks ago? Or like no, a month it's, ago? it's, it's okay, different. Mom. This is the type of house I grew up in. You go upstairs, there's one bathroom, master bedroom, bedroom, bedroom attached, kitchen right there. Uh, I, I don't, it's- it's, it's, like an, it's, it's a normal house. It's a normal house. It's probably, I don't know, 2,300 square feet. Like it's a very, it's a fine house, but $1.2 million. I- I could t- we you know this is it's been two years of this. I feel horrible for new home buyers. Th- these people could be underwater forever, and I guess it doesn't really matter because they're not like reselling it. But just the prices that people where does the money come from? How are people buying houses? I I I, I did the Zillow thing in Marco again because it just fascinates me. I, I wanted to like see what, what the house the Airbnb we're staying at. It's I don't know. It's seventeen hundred square feet. It's one floor. And it's in a great spot. There's a pool and it's right on the water. But the house is, it's a rental and it's got some age, but it's like millions of dollars. It's like, it's crazy. And I I look at some of these and I think, think about if you bought a home here, you know, five years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you won the lottery. Yeah. It's, so so and and it happened in a lot of cities too. So if you own a home, you're good, right? Because you've got all this equity. But again, new home buyers just got royally fucked. And I like don't think there's any. I don't think there's anything that's going to level that playing field. Yeah. So like when we when I graduated college during the GFC, we got a raw deal because the the labor market was just brutal. Yes. Uh, and now this generation is is taking it on the chin with real estate. Really, really, really rough. Yes. Yeah. So it's like yes, I have a job. I make more money. I, the the thing I've seen, I think Connor Sen tweeted this, is saying like, what are the spending habits of these young people going to be if they have a better job than millennials had back then? maybe this is why you're seeing crazy speculation and stuff and more travel and all this kind of things because what else are they going to spend their money on if they can't, right. if they're priced out of a right. house? Because right, think right. About younger, people, think, younger people definitely have more disposable income than we did. That's, there's no doubt about that. As a young person, think about who you're competing with to buy houses. Baby boomers who probably are paying all cash and older millennials who have a ton of home equity built in already. You can't yeah. win that game. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, all right, credit card junkie. Did he get it? Uh, Robin Hood, new credit card. I put my name on the, the list. I got to check it out at least. So they said 3% cash back on everything, 5% through Robin Hood Travel, which is like, the, the travel sites on the credit cards are just, they're not good. Any of them, right? I feel like the, you don't get deals, you get more points, but I feel like booking travel through the credit card companies is rarely a good deal. Mm. Unless you really care about those points. Uh, you have to be a Robin Hood Gold member, so it's $5 a month. I think this is actually, I think the money goes right into your brokerage account. But I think this is actually pretty good timing on their part because it seems like the, the deals for credit cards have kind of waned in recent years. So I think this is actually pretty good timing on their part. I think it's not a bad time to do it. Did you sign up for it? No. No, I'm, I have enough credit cards. I'm good. I, I do too, but I, I, I can't help myself. I got way too much credit. All right. I've got some good news. Uh, okay. This is from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. The median wealth gap for never married adults. So never married men versus never married women has shrunk to the narrowest since, I don't know, this, this data goes back to 1989. So there oh, was a that monster- increase in net worth for women. Holy cow. Median, yeah, there was a monster spike uh, for women, for, for single women specifically. Not sure, exactly sure what's driving this, but definitely good news. But this, okay, I, I was thinking about this. Is this because women live longer than men, but this is never married? That's a massive spike. That 2019 to 2022 period. You know, that, this that, is on me. I, I should have read the article. I put the link in. I forgot to read the article. Sorry about that. No, but no, it's, it's the, the chart kind of says it all though. But yeah. this, this period, this 2020 to 2023, 2022 period is going to stand out on so many levels in the future. I feel like they're going to be looking back at this period for decades to come and being like, what, what happened back then? Oh, the world changed. This is <laughs> COVID is the big is is COVID the biggest watershed moment of our lives? I'd say 9-11, but it's COVID's gonna be close. Not I I guess you could say COVID. No, no, no. I think I think I think COVID changed yeah. everything. Yeah, you're right. It, 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 I thought it was 9-11, and I thought it was a great financial crisis. It probably is COVID in terms of like it really the the past. There's a clear we, line of demarcation. There's a before yeah. COVID, there's a before COVID and after COVID. Um, all right, Ben. I told you that I've been doing some shopping lately. Uh, new shirt, not to brag. The days you spend less than one hundred and seventy dollars on it. I hope. Don't worry about what I spent. Uh, I, do, I do worry. I, you need. <laughs> I'm going to become your personal shopper and help you not spend so much money. So I don't know any. So I, I shopped at Bloomingdale's, as I said. My wife's like, "You're so weird. Why are you buying clothes at Bloomingdale's?" I was like, I don't, <laughs> "Where else should I be buying clothes?" She's like, "I don't know. Not here." And I don't know any of the brands that I'm buying, but anyhow. So it I got seem like a, it seems like a, such a boomer move to go to the mall and go to Bloomingdale's. I'm sorry to generationally tag you. So what I did was I finally, I cleaned up my closet and I'm not quite sure what took me so long. And I learned a few things. 90% of my clothes that I bought in, from 2010 to 2020 were Gap. Okay. Everything. T-shirts, jeans, hoodies. Everything was Gap. I don't know what I was waiting for. Like, I have uh, I have socks from 2010 that I don't even wear anymore. <laughs> I do a I, I probably once every six months I clean my closet out and take a big garbage bag stuff to Goodwill. Yeah, so I did that. Felt good. I don't wear it anymore or whatever. Yeah. And I had a few like eh, I kind of like the shirt, but I was like, if but here's my rule: if I haven't worn it in five years, goodbye. What am I doing? Why am I why am I hoarding shirts? Five years. That's a long time. I would say like. Anything over 12 months, you got to get rid of it. Unless it's like something you're going to wear to a specific event. Oh, 12 months. Oh, that's interesting. So you're, 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 I mean, you probably spend 10 times as much as I do on clothes in a given year. Yes, but I spend like 30% of what you spend on, on an individual item though. So I can get more of, my money can go further than you. I'm going to guess, I definitely spend less than $1,000 in clothes a year. Like in the last okay. 10 years, for sure. I, I'm way over that. I like buying clothes. Uh, I got a question for you. Who's, Go who's, the, who's the sucker here? Because I, for this Airbnb, I bought, I went to the store, I got my own, I went to Publix here, which is the, you know, the, the every, every city in Florida I think has a Publix, right? Or my, grand, my, grand, my grandfather worked at Publix uh, in the 70s. I come from a line of blue collar workers. We, we're, we use our hands, Ben. I do too. 
You know the Brunswick bowling pins? My grandfather worked for them, making bowling pins. Oh, no way. Mm hmm. Hmm. Uh, all right. Three and one. I got a three and one shampoo, conditioner, body wash, like a suave, $2 or something. So who's a sucker? The people who buy them individually, the body wash, the shampoo, and the conditioner separately, or the people who are buying the cheapo one that's all together like me? Who's the sucker? Someone has to be the sucker there. Because it seems to work fine. I'm going to say the individual buyers, but I got to be honest. I miss conditioner. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I used to have beautiful long hair, Ben, and it all fell I, out. I've but seen I, but, your, the, the picture. You, you have like long flowing kind of curly-ish. I think you should grow the sides out. I, I think you should just do it. I really, <laughs> that's a, it's the I really want to see ever. you. I really want to see you with a Larry David. Maybe in thirty years, but I do miss conditioner. Those were, uh, those were okay. good times. A bunch of people emailed us. You asked, how do they shorten shirt sleeves at a tailor? And a bunch of people. I'd say twenty five percent of the people said they cut, they take the cuff off and they cut it there. Yeah. I mean, those seventy five percent said no, they cut it off at the shoulder and short it that way. So I'm going to take the people who said shoulder. Oh, interesting. Because I, I saw, I saw the, the this first people that cut like the what is this even yeah. called the cut the. The cuff, right? The cuff. Yeah. Anyway, the okay. more you know. All right, Ben. This is from Jim Bianco. He's tweeted, fun chart. Uh, 50, by the way, I uh, I put that video, the the Lake Michigan video on my Instagram. <laughs> and I got on my personal Instagram, but I never, I never put animal spirit stuff on my personal Instagram, at least like videos. And I got so much feedback. Apparently, apparently, Holmes which is the acronym for the Great Lakes, yeah. is the one thing that everybody retained from elementary school. <laughs> Except you. <laughs> I, no, I remember it, but in the heat of the moment. Oh. And, 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 like, everybody was like, you don't remember Holmes? I was like, it was on camera. I got flustered. <laughs> Although the Erie River was funny. I did laugh at that. That was good. All right, so anyhow, so Jim Bianca tweeted, uh, fun chart, 50% of the U.S. population lives in blue counties. 50% of the U.S. population lives in the orange counties. And there's a hey, hundred... Grand Rapids made it into the blue. I'm on the blue. Which one are you? You're on, you're on the, the West well, Coast? It's yeah, it's Detroit and Grand okay. Rapids, yeah. Uh, and there's 148 blue counties and 2,998 orange counties. All Unbelievable. Right, if, you wanna, if you want cheap housing, go to the orange. Someone actually... Not, not cheap. Actually, somebody sent us an email about the Midwest surge, and we're going to get to that next week. Uh, ben, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that I saw. I was like, huh, you know what? Yeah, that's true. Uh, the, the company that owns Jack Daniels, Brown Foreman, not doing so hot. And it was, you know, nobody drinks Jack Daniels anymore. Isn't that true? Oh, that's in, yeah, because people want the high end, like whiskey drinking is like a new, that's but a new if thing, bourbon. Yeah, I'll, t I'll, take, I'll take the Woodford Reserve. You know, I was always, Pe a, Jim Beam, have, I was always a Jim Beam guy myself. I was a Evan Williams guy. Oh, Evan Williams is the worst. That <laughs> stuff you I was, was blue collar. awful. <laughs> I mean, I did. I, I, I drank Jim Beam when I wanted to make some bad decisions in college, but but uh, but, Evan, but Evan Jack Williams and, was Jack and Coke. But Jack and Coke used to be the thing. That oh, used to be the true. drink. Jack and Coke was it's just an easy. That's true. That was so that's not a thing go to the anymore, bar. Huh? Jack and Coke. But we've all become uh, uh, liquor snobs. I, li I actually like Jack and Coke. I love Jack and Coke. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, whiskey makers, coffee. but whiskey also is in trouble. Whiskey, this is from the journal. Whiskey makers revenue in the U.S. fell 2.2% in 2023 to $12.3 billion. Oh, everyone drinks tequila now. So here we go. U.S. case volume sales by category. Tequila is so hot right now. Oh, this is an interesting number. Behind tequila is cordials. What would what even that be mean? in that category? Isn't that like after dinner drinks? Is it like a Tom Collins? I don't, I don't, I don't, no, that's I don't a cocktail. No, a cordial is like a, like a liqueur, like a okay. frangelico. Isn't Tom Collins like a liqueur? No, Tom Collins is a type of drink. I, the that's only, like, honestly, the only thing I know Tom Collins from is Meet the Parents. Oh, we're all Tom Collins mix. Gotta go to the store. Uh, Tom Collins, I don't know if that's sour mix. You know, I don't think I ever told you this story. I went to bartending school. School. I took like a course. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Told you, listen, I'm a blue collar guy. I had all of these jobs. Uh, waiter, uh, bus boy, Hey, caddy, I was a bus boy. Bus boy's uh, the worst. Valet Parker for years. Wait, what was the worst? Bus boy. Because the waiters and waitresses screw you out of tips. They're supposed to give you a percentage of their tips. They never give you enough. I was a bus boy at a catering hall. Uh, not a great job. Not a great job. Um, anyway, I, I wasn't able to get a job. I, I got the certification. 
Oh, never no, put it to use. You? Never put it to use. Never put it to use. I did get a job one time in Long Beach, actually. And I did, I, I poured some beers and the, the guy never invited me back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, someone's gonna have to email us in what cordials means because I'm drawing a blank here. Cognac's right, taking it on the chin. Nobody's drinking cognac anymore or rum. All right, so I have, I, I have the perfect Miami Vice. I, I think about this. I wrote a blog post last week. Like the, the alternative to a 60 40 could be a 60 30 10. Okay? okay. So the perfect Miami Vice is 60 30 10. Wait, 60%, hold on. Let me, let me, 60%. 60% strawberry daiquiri, okay. 40%, 30 pina colada, I'm with 10% you. floater. I'm with you. That's a perfect Miami Vice. Yeah. I've had a couple. I'm having another one today. Did you ever go to, did I ever send you to Stilts on the water? Stilts. I don't it's a good, remember. Right on the water. Okay. All right. Recommendations. They had Manchester by the Sea on the Rewatchables last week. And this is a movie that I heard from dozens of people saying, do not see this movie. It's way too sad. If you're a parent, never see this movie. And I, I all right, you know what? I don't want to be depressed. I don't like to watch depressing movies. I do. Um, but I finally watched it because, like, you know what? I only give it a try. I, I know going in, I already knew what, like, I already knew what the bad part was. That how it's going to be so sad. Kids dying. That's the worst thing in the world. The movie was way more like lighthearted than I thought for as much death as that was in the movie. It was actually it was a really good movie. Great movie. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd ever watch it again. It's a very no. good movie. It's a one and done for me. Casey Affleck is very good. So is Michelle yeah. Williams. All right. I already mentioned the fish state the whale. Uh, I don't got. I got nothing else. All right, I uh, on the way out to Colorado last week, we took a we took a seven thirty flight, which is really dumb. We were I was up at four thirty; it was just horrible. Uh, and I say all that to say maybe I was tired when I fired this up, but I tried to watch Ferrari, and I just really didn't care for it. Now, in fairness, I only saw twenty minutes. I was tired, blah blah. Did you see Ferrari? Is it good? Do I need to re- do I need to try it again? I've decided to I'm I'm against any Adam Driver movie where he has an Italian accent because the other one was bad too. What was the or the Gucci oh, one or the House of Gucci? I didn't see that. Did he but, have you know, a Michael Mann? Accent? I, yeah. Uh, Bad. Okay. All right. Uh, listeners, if you love that movie, let me know. Uh, I took Kobe to see Godzilla and Kong. Okay. My, my son Jordan wants to see it, it so bad. Okay. He loved it. What did loved you think? Uh, how many can they make? Because I feel like everyone was exactly the same. Oh, it was pretty bad. Okay. It was pretty bad. Uh, but it wasn't for me. And it was, you know, it was entertaining enough, but it, yeah, it was, it was pretty rotten. And, but I was reminded of Godzilla minus one, like how come they're going to make such great movies and now we're a Hollywood big monster. It was just, just, it was just junk. Okay. Oh, I did try one. I, I, I made it through a half hour of the new roadhouse the other night. Garbage, just garbage. No, but, but, but intentional garbage. But like the fights, not- but the fight scenes didn't seem real. It's like they use CGI in the fight scenes. It just, it. I loved it. I don't, when I say uh, loved I, it, I had I, I had a great time. Listen, any any movie that takes place in the in the Caribbean, I'm automatically that's in. true. It was in it was in Key West. No, it was not the Caribbean. It was Key West. Well, so, so you know what I mean. Same thing. Uh, so actually, Roadhouse has attracted fifty. This is from Sportico. Fifty million worldwide viewers on Prime Video over its first two weeks. Uh, it is Amazon MGM Studios' most watched produced film debut ever. Do you know why these streaming numbers are so huge when new movies come out and they say like this is the most streamed movie in history? Because there's no new movies that come out anymore. So everyone watches new stuff. Everyone wants to watch a new movie because there's no new good movies, barely. That's why this stuff that, gets streamed so much. I think that's mostly accurate. Uh, there are, right, there so, are still good movies, but it's, it's such a lower percentage than it used to be. True. All right, last thing. Um, on the rewatchables this week, they have a movie called uh, Shot Caller. Never even and, um, and they're talking, I'm like, how have I never heard of this movie? Let me read you this, by, this description and tell me if you're in. Or tell me if you think that I would be in. Okay. A California stockbroker is arrested and charged for a fatal DUI accident on, and on his lawyer's advice takes a plea deal which sees him sentenced to 16 months in prison. While incarcerated, he becomes involved with a violent white supremacist gang. Okay. I thought maybe he was going to be giving out stock tips in prison, but okay. That's a... Uh, I'm know. in. I watch I'm all movies. In. Sure. I've honestly never heard of it before. Me either. Uh, I'm in for that. All right, Ben. Uh, did we go long? It's hard to tell. The, we, had, we had a break in the action during this episode. Listeners can't tell because of our wonderful production team, but we had some internet issues. All right. And they were on, uh, it was on my end. It was on my end, not Ben's. That's true. I'm pretty good here. Decent internet in Florida. Um, I'm going to go have some lunch on the beach. Probably have a Miami Vice. And that's it. Pool Enjoy. later. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. 
Uh, all right. Animal Spirits Pod at thecompoundnews.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.